Welcome to Blackbird Writers Presents. Uh, today I'm interviewing Rick Trion, the author of uh, Divided States, among other books. Um, Rick is a Rick writes books about life and death in the Lone Star State. Uh, his debut, Deep Background, uh, won the Pencraft Award for Excellence in Suspense. Welcome, Rick. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's really great to talk to you today. Um, Divided States was amazing. I, I mean, what an action thriller. I, I appreciate that. It's the first action thriller I've ever written. So uh, I'm glad that, uh, you know, people who don't read in that genre liked it. And then I've heard from people who do read in that genre liked it too. So, uh, you know, I guess I got the right um, sort of genre tropes, but then also included enough of the stuff that, you know, makes it not just sort of a genre thriller that uh, it's, you know, getting a uh, pretty universal uh, praise, which, you know, is always good when you're an author. Right, exactly. Well, it was so fast paced and that's what I loved about it. Um, so uh, it's Divided States is set in a, a sort of near dystopian future. Um, can you set the st stage for readers? Yeah, it's uh, so there are eight new nations on what was the continental United States. Uh, Alaska joined the Western territories, uh, which is not the West Coast. That's uh, the liberated states of America. And they've all got, um, you know, names that I think are appropriate, that, but that I also found a little bit funny and that the different characters could use play on words and stuff. Uh, and then Hawaii stuck with the United States because they needed Pearl Harbor and uh, the U.S., um, which, you know, is basically the North, if you want to call it that, had retained uh, a lot of the, you know, control of the military uh, where it regionally, you know, stayed uh, put. And a big part of the story is that it was sort of like, you know, uh, possession is nine-tenths of the law whenever it comes to the military. Everybody just kind of, whatever bases they had in their, in their country, they kept, and uh, they also absorbed that National Guard which is, you know, kind of the easiest way it would really happen. And, uh, you know, you said it's a dystopian and it's, uh, it is in that, you know, it would probably be a scary place for a lot of people to live, but it's also not like Hunger Games type of right. dystopian because I don't do enough world building uh, to be able to do a fantasy thing like that. You know, crime fiction writers generally stick like in, you know, the present, whatever city they're in, or, you know, if it's historical crime, then, you know, they do research on that part, but it's usually not, in the future and usually not in a world that doesn't actually exist. So I didn't attempt that. And really it's just a, a thriller of people who are existing in this world. Uh, and you know, they, they comment about it, but mostly they're trying to get through their daily lives and then they get sucked into this uh, conspiracy, which you know is how a lot of action, you know, spy military thrillers kind of start. Yeah. Do you mind if I show the cover? Cause- um... No, absolutely not. The, the cover really shows, and I found myself referring to the mm -hmm. map while I was reading it. Yeah, and that was intentional. That was, we we wanted to be big and bold and not, uh, you know, hide sort of what the story was about or where it was going to be. And obviously a map was going to be very important. So we thought, well, why not just put it on the cover instead of trying to do an illustration on the inside? Because that would make it feel maybe even more like a fantasy uh, sort of thriller. And we also did list um, the different nations and what states uh, are within or even in, in one of the countries, what counties it's broken up into because it's so small. Uh, and so we were hoping, you know, we could get them uh, from like a marketing perspective, you know, I've got it too. You've got, uh, they'll say, oh, a map, you know, divided states, you know, it, you know what, what to, and then they'll flip over and they'll see, oh, here it lists, you know, how this, how the country broke up. And hopefully they're like, well, how on earth did that happen? And then, you know, that'll make them want to go ahead and turn the page and start reading. Right. Yeah. Um, so the book is also told from three different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Lori Young, Eric Fowler, and Jeremiah Reynolds. Um, and their differing viewpoints give the reader a real good like blow by blow of what's happening. Um, so can you introduce the characters and and their mission? Yeah, uh, so Lori is your protagonist. 
you know, not only because she is in the first uh, chapter, you know, and it's alternating chapters, but uh, also because, you know, she has the more emotional character arc, not that they don't all have that at all. You know, I tried to give them all that, but, you know, she's the focus of the story. Uh, she used to be a detective uh, with the Amarillo Police Department, a homicide detective. And of course, I uh, grew up and have lived uh, in Amarillo and in the Panhandle. So, you know, I definitely uh, said it, you know, kind of where I know. Um, and the the way that she left the force is important uh, as you get further along into her character development and how she becomes uh, such a central figure in this uh, struggle for um, control of this new um allied nations of north america you know the the new it's it's like an american european union if you want to think about it that way right and so that's you know the terrorists are on one side or the other of should we reunite or you know should uh, the status quo the new status quo remain um and then you have eric who is her employer uh a former uh spy he's a you know former cia he was uh maybe a little higher than middle management um you know he was one of the directors and he uh, comes down on the side of wanting to reunite the country. And he's part of, you know, he's a, he's a tactician who thinks he's figured out a way to make that happen without, um, you know, starting, you know, World War III, which, you know, in an action thriller, is, you know, a lot of times it's a little bit of a, a trope, but, you know, that's kind of what you're always trying to avoid. Um, so he has employed Lori as a salesperson in his uh, company, which sells uh, pipeline automation equipment, which is the valves that open and close and the uh, machines that do the opening and closing remotely. And I used to sell those products. So I have kind of a knowledge of, of that too. And then, uh, you know, that sort of area, the oil field and stuff like that comes into play also in the plot. And then yeah. you have uh, Jeremiah, who is uh, Lori's ex-husband. And, you know, there you, you learn more about there. And then he also has his own love interest on his uh, team of tier one ex-military operators who are part of a transportation organization that's able to travel across the continent sort of more freely than anyone else can. Uh, and, you know, what he does and what they do uh, is also kind of the almost the third uh, piece of the puzzle that makes this really a scary scenario for all of the characters involved. Yeah. Yeah, and and I like the interaction and then the the closeness, the X and the you know. So they had histories together, and um, and relationship stuff is more my area of expertise. So, <laughs> yeah. well, and that's the feedback I've gotten is the people who don't read military thrillers are like, oh, but I really loved, you know, the relationships and the interaction and the history and all that stuff, and then you know, the people who read that genre are like, you know, it was all that, but then, yeah, I really found myself, you know, very interested in the characters too, which is how you have, you know, those kind of uh, action thrillers that, you know, hopefully rise above, you know, like the the ones, you know, like Brad Taylor and Brad Thor and, and those guys, you know, who have a good sense of, of, of both, you know, really emotional characterization, but then also a lot of cool action, a lot of research into the, you know, either the CIA, the military, uh, what Don Bentley does, the DIA and the army. So, um, you know, a mix of both of those. And I tried to hit that sweet spot and so far no one's told me otherwise. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go with it. Yeah, no, it was great. Lori, Lori Young was a real, uh, badass and, uh, but she's also like a real damaged person. Mm -hmm. Um, she'll be the key to the success of their plan. And I want you to explain her relationship uh, well, you kind of did to some of the others, um, but without giving too much away. Yeah, she, uh, so, you know, as with, you know, I guess sort of the um, divorced couples that I know, uh, they definitely, you know, have, you know, backslid a time or two with each other and there's never, they're never going to be able to completely separate from each other. And so, it, you know, that, uh, that closeness that they still share, even, you know, if it's not emotionally the same as it was, uh, does um, come into play in terms of what the, uh, you know, the the bigger picture terrorists are trying to do with her within their plan. Uh, and then, you know, her relationship with Eric is uh, interesting more, almost more on his end, because, you know, he, him being a spy, what they always try to do is uh, get uh, people to do um their work because 
you know, CIA officers are actually not spies. The spies are the people they recruit on the other side, and they're the spies within the organization. So uh, he's trying to work her in that way. And so uh, his relationship with her is, is very interesting, both in terms of how it would uh, play out with, you know, a CIA officer and his assets, and also uh, between, you know, like you said, you know, a damaged, uh, divorced person and somebody who may or may not be trying to take advantage of that, uh, you know, point in their lives. Yeah. And just to be clear for readers, she's a, a drug addict mm -hmm. and probably an alcoholic too. And yeah. 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 She, uh, you know, with, without giving away any spoilers, she definitely uses drugs and alcohol to help her get through her day-to-day. Uh, -day. Yeah, definitely. Um, so all of these operatives um, have some serious skills as fighters, um, and they have extensive, extensive knowledge of weapons and strategic combat. And um, so, I imagine you've done like tons of research for this. Yeah. Uh, so to use one of the, uh, some of the terminology, some of it was human, human intel in that, uh, you know, I, I have people who have worked uh, in the CIA and who have worked uh, in sort of the top tier military organizations or, or uh, the contractors who work overseas with those folks. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of that. Um, you know, nothing classified, I don't think ever passed through my ears, but, you know, just uh, the general feeling of how it is, uh, definitely had to read more uh, of those uh, novels. Um, you know, I'm, I definitely am a Tom Clancy fan, which, you know, some people might recognize a few of those threads when they read the book. Uh, but then, you know, I had to read contemporary stuff, like uh, I mentioned Don Bentley earlier, you know, I definitely read his, uh, his new ones, um, you know, Brad Taylor, another, another one that I went to, to get a feel for how uh, the books are written, but also, you know, the research that they've done, you know, I was able to, you know, glean some of that. Um, and then, you know, a lot of, a lot of internet uh, research. One of the interesting things I found that I used uh, that uh, I, you know, I still have a bookmark is if you go on Reddit and there's a lot of stuff on Reddit, but sometimes you get threads about um, these military guys talking to each other you know, on a message board, and they're using the lingo and this stuff like that. So it's not literally dialogue, but it's as close as you're going to get. Um, and so anything I didn't know, I, I looked up any, you know, uh, acronyms and stuff like that. I tried to pay attention to how they use them. Uh, and so I tried to work that into the dialogue or in, even into the internal monologue of the characters. So you were playing uh, spy. And then, you know, some of it was reading uh, news, which she you know, I do anyway. So that, um, that part was easy and fun for me. <laughs> so yeah, you were playing spy. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> yeah, no. And I was just wondering, because a lot of writers do like train, you know, do martial arts or whatever, just to get a feel oh, for yeah. how it works. And if you ever that did anything, I wanted to do, but the, uh, pandemic prevented me from doing some of that. But, uh, now that it's starting to get past us, uh, you know, I, I'm going to be able to go out to uh, like the gun ranges with some of the folks I was talking about earlier, uh, take like a, um, like a citizen's academy with the police department and stuff like that. So uh, all that is on the docket probably for 2022. Um, yeah. but, Writers uh, Police luckily, Academy too. Yeah. And luckily, I, um, you know, a background in, in crime reporting and journalism, I've been around and seen some of that stuff in terms of uh, uh, police and, and SWAT, which is not exactly military, but it's paramilitary and you can get a feel. Like I had some scenes where they were like exiting a vehicle and, and doing stuff like that. Like that was based on stuff I'd seen SWAT do whenever I was out at scenes. Uh, uh, and I definitely probably, one thing I didn't do in this book that uh, the real good military thrillers do is talk about the process of getting someone in your sights and leading them or, you know, how much the recoil is and stuff like that. That stuff I could not get a feel for because everything was, was shut down. And even if it wasn't, I wasn't comfortable enough going out into the world for that reason, because I, you know, yeah. obviously don't have experience with guns, you know, other, that's why I would be going to learn. So I didn't figure that I would be in the best place to try to, you know, 
learn about that sort of thing while I had all of this other stuff on my mind. So that is next, uh, especially if, you know, this continues or if I continue to write other stuff in this subgenre of thriller. Will you? I mean, <laughs> um, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, this was a, a one book deal with Black Rose, uh, which is pretty standard for them. Uh, small presses, as you know, work differently than, you know, like uh, my friend Taylor Moore, he uh, wrote Down Range and it's, uh, you know, he got a, a two book deal and like they have like, you know, a Garrett Cole novel on his first cover. So obviously, you know, he's working on the sequel and that happened that way. The small presses, they're not always uh, committed to that. Some are, some aren't. Uh, Black Rose, uh, they, I'm sure they would like me to write another one. Uh, one, one thing that uh, will determine that is I'm uh, currently un unrepresented. So I'm looking for, uh, you know, that literary agent and uh, to try to, you know, um, get the, the best deal I can. And I have a new project that's actually uh, very, almost the complete opposite of this, which is a mystery. It's a PI mystery also set here. Uh, and so I'm working with a critique group on that. And that's going to be the next project that I'm focused on. So if I get agent book deal for that, you know, will they care if I write, uh, continue to write these for this other press, uh, you know, will my agent say go for it and I won't even take commission like, you know, there's just so many variables. Uh, and if that doesn't happen with, uh, with the PI mystery, well then, uh, yeah, I would be very excited to write another one of these. And uh, this is the first <laughs> novel I've written that uh, not only publishers, but uh, readers have wanted to see a second one. Uh, cause my debut deep background was pretty dark. Um, and so a lot of times with those thrillers, you don't necessarily want to revisit those characters. Uh, now a few of the characters do their names come up in this, uh, but they're not POV characters and they're just kind of on the outskirts a little bit. So, uh, they exist in the same universe and it's a little bit of an Easter egg, but, uh, you know, deep background, I never planned it on doing a, a, a series, although I left it open as I did with this one. Uh, and then my Bartholomew Beck novels, uh, there is a sequel to that coming out in August. Um, and that one, uh, I realized that I didn't do a great job of setting it up. So I struggled writing that sequel and my publisher knows it and uh, everybody knows it. So I'm not afraid to say it, but uh, uh, you know, it was my second novel. So I have learned from that. And this is actually the fourth manuscript I've finished even though it came out before um, The Price of Silence, which will be the third manuscript I finished. Uh, which was written completely during the pandemic. And, you, and, you know, my uh, editor and I could tell that that's whenever I wrote it. So, uh, <laughs> but this story, I feel like is probably the, the best representation of where I am uh, or where I was, you know, six months ago or a year ago as a writer. And then, so that uh, if, if you're going to read my, one of my novels for the first time, you know, like many novelists, I'll say, go ahead and read this one first. And then, and then you can go back and read my backlist if you want. Yeah. Do you have some of your books you can hold up and show people? Uh, you thought I would have that, um, but no, not not in this space. My office where I work uh, doesn't have good internet on purpose because I don't want to be distracted all the time. So I'm actually uh, in, in sort of my, my bedroom area and I don't have uh, all my books in here. Uh, but my website is ricktreon.com and you can go and I've got all the yeah. covers and information there and uh you know there's deep background and there's let the guilty pay which came out came out during the pandemic but was written uh before then and then uh, divided states is the third novel that's published and then the price of silence the sequel to let the guilty pay comes out august 3rd and uh, that's just uh about you know a fifth of my busy year that i've been having so yeah you've been at it haven't you that's great um I just want to have one more question about uh, divided states. Mm -hmm. And in in the acknowledgments, you you address the elephant in the room, um, and that's the parallels to the current political environment and how uncanny that was. Um, so, what exactly gave you the idea for this book? So the origin story, I guess, of divided states is uh, I went to the University of Texas. I got a Bachelor of Journalism from there. And uh, so I'm naturally a Longhorns fan. And uh, they had a little streak of success in the middle of a desert of uh, not success following their national championship in 2005. And that included the uh, Sugar Bowl in the uh, Teen Sugar Bowl for the 2018 season because it was on New Year's Day. And so uh, my family and I took a trip uh, down there to New Orleans, which is where it's played, because it's within driving distance and it's a fun city. So uh, we were down there and New Year's Eve 2018, 
2018 going into 2019, uh, we were watching Florida Georgia Line and Marin Morris were doing. Oh, I lost you. Oh, sorry. So you were watching who? Uh, well, we, we were watching uh, the concert Florida Georgia Line and Marin Morris were performing. And uh, we were waiting for the ball to drop in New York, which of course is 11 p.m. Central Time. And, uh, you know, whenever it came up on the screen, I, it just like a scene hit me whole, you know, which uh, I, I understand doesn't happen very often. The only time it's ever happened to me. Um, but, you know, the, the opening scene in the book is, um, and this isn't a spoiler at all, it's a, it's a mass shooting and it takes place in the French Quarter in New Orleans during a New Year's Eve celebration. I don't give the year and that's on purpose because, uh, you know, I don't want people to have any year to anchor this to because believe right. it or not, some people will say, well, that didn't actually happen. Well, it was speculative fiction, but still. And I also wanted it to feel, uh, you know, forever right around the corner, you know, if you wanted to think of it that way. And then eventually it'll be alternate history once you get further enough along, you know, right. 20, 30 years from now or whatever. But anyway, uh, so that scene that plays out here with, you know, the ball dropping and the screen, the screen wobbling and people trying to escape and the mass shooting, that all, you know, came to me as the ball was uh, dropping. And so that was 2018 going into 2019. So it was before the 2020 election, before, obviously before, you know, January 6th and all that stuff. Uh, I live in Texas where secession is always, you know, every year people say that Texas should secede and they think that they legally can, which of course they can't, but they can divide into states within their own border, which is interesting. But uh, so I suppose that played into, um, you know, the thought of having a, of, uh, you know, a broken up nation, which I also was part of that initial, you know, when it hit me was even that, uh, you know, being in that sort of environment was there. Uh, but I suppose that was in the zeitgeist. I'm certainly not the only person in the last, you know, three or four years who's written about, you know, uh, post session United States. Uh, so it was in the zeitgeist, I suppose. But anyway, I wrote it as a short story. Mm -hmm. and took it to a critique group and I don't write short stories except for for my local writing clubs anthology uh, to support them mostly but um, I, I said you know is this a short story I gave it to him they said well no it's not at all it's a really great piece of writing but it is the first chapter to a novel is, is what you've written so I said okay so I <laughs> went ahead came up with a synopsis you know just to maybe get it out of my system and it did not get out of my system. So when Black Rose said, hey, do you have anything in the pipeline? I'm like, well, actually I have this and I sent it to him. And then a couple of weeks later they said, oh, you know, this, you know, could be really, really timely. You know, let's uh, give me a contract. They said, you know, we'll publish it to just, it's basically as soon as you can get it written uh, and then we can get it edited. And, and so the release date was set for, uh, you know, June 10th of this year. And all of that was also before the election and before all the rest. And so as I was finishing and finishing up edits is when the election happened and when January 6th happened. So I actually had to have a brief conversation with Black Rose with the publisher Reagan and say, so will releasing this book be in bad taste considering you know what's just happened and with the insurrection and all that stuff? And he's like, keep working. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll figure out whether or not we think it is. And you know, uh, luckily things did not turn you know as they, you know, sort of ended up doing my book because I couldn't ignore what was happening. So I had to lean into it and just create an alternate version of what was sort of happening and how it could go, you know, the opposite way of the way it went. And I wanted it, it ended up reflecting kind of what, uh, what really happened. And, you know, I actually wasn't going to go all that deep into how the nation broke up. I wanted that to be a little more mysterious, but uh, I could not, you know, sort yeah. of let people think that it had happened from real events i had to create alternate events that would have led to that so well and that's why you need another book too because i kept looking for those answers as well yeah. i was like what what happened <laughs> yeah and, and if there are if there is a sequel that'll give me more time to you know go back and and dribble in even more of that how everything happened especially with uh you know, we, you know, we have like, you know, how Texas happened, but, you know, we don't really get into how the United States, how it kept itself together. Uh, there, there's one, uh, I'm not going to spoil it, but there's a small nation that formed that's kind of funny to me. And hopefully it was a little bit lighthearted, but it ended up playing a pretty big role in the end of the story. And so uh, I got into a little bit of how that happened, but uh, maybe telling maybe having a scene where I'm talking to somebody who fought in that skirmish, you know, and how all that happened, that would, uh, that would kind of be fun too. So yeah, a sequel, you know, there's plenty of stuff and plenty of places I could go. So, oh, yeah. you know, I personally hope it happens, but uh, you know, that's not always, always your call.
<laughs> yeah, it's true. I know. But the, you know, when you get to the end and you you just like, ah, you can see it. But but yeah, I'm glad that people want to revisit those characters and like Lori and the rest enough to figure out what happens to them. And especially a lot of the feedback I get, you know, again, no spoilers, but uh, some of her character development and, uh, you know, her state of mind and how she ends. Uh, I've had people say, A, you know, what is happening? And my answer is, I want you to think about that. You know, that was the point. And B, you know, a sequel would be able to see how that turn in the last uh, act continues on for her life and how it relates to her past. Yeah. Yeah. All very good. Well, thanks, Rick, so much for being here today. And what will you let let Thank readers where, where know where to find you? Yes, um, you can find me at ricktreon.com and there are links to all my social media on that site. Um, and I don't have a very uniform name because uh, I was like a beta tester for Twitter because of college, uh, you know, we were, uh, and then uh, same for Facebook, we were like the second round of after the Ivy Leagues, you know, YouTube was one of the big colleges got in. So, you know, I have all kinds of stuff on there. And then uh, Instagram is a little more, you know, pretty much my name. So because <laughs> I didn't join that till late, but all that's there. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, I'm the president of the Texas High Plains Riders. So if you go to TexasHighPlainsRiders.com, you can figure out what all I'm doing there. Um, and then I also uh, just took a job as the editorial director of Blue Handle Publishing. So you can go to BlueHandlePublishing.com and see what all I have going on there. Uh, you know, they're all different, slightly different profiles uh, for the different uh, things that I'm doing. And like yes. I said, it's been a busy year. So <laughs> yeah, it sure has. Well, thanks again so much for being here and we'll talk to you again soon. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Tracy. All right. Bye now. Bye.